Hi, this is Stephen Mead. Over the years, I've read hundreds of books and spent thousands of hours developing what I call the bullseye belief system. And I've used that system to develop my own companies as well as help others learn to be specific, targeted, and focused to get exactly what they want in life. This is the Bullseye Guy podcast. Stephen Mead back again with another Bullseye Guy podcast. Uh, super, super excited with um, a guest today. Normally, we have people that have an amazing story themselves, but this is going to be a treat because this is a historical family history of a brand, actually two brands that we all know and love, but we're going to talk about some historical things with Mitzi Purdue, and then I'm super excited to learn about all the things she's doing now, so I'm going to turn it over. Mitzi Purdue, introduce yourself if you would. Hi, what a pleasure to be here. And I especially like the idea of talking about entrepreneurship because I am the daughter of the co-founder of the Sheraton Hotel chain. He and my uncle and his roommate from college founded Sheraton in the 1930s. But I was also, uh, I'm the widow of Frank Perdue who had almost the same story as my father. Both men started with no employees and at the time of their deaths in entirely different realms they each employed 20,000 people. And I love to share the stories that I know that nobody else would know other than a daughter or a wife. Yeah, and let's, let's start. Rather than me leading the way, Mitzi, I wouldn't even know where to start other than as an entrepreneur, I'm always fascinated with stories about some of the trials, tribulations. Like when you start a company, there's so many things that could go wrong or people tell you it's not going to work. Just share with us whatever you want with your insights from the Sheridan side up through wherever you want to go with this. Oh, I love that approach. Thank you. Oh, this is a dream. <laughs> I'll start with my father. And in the early 1930s, say 1933 or so, it was at the height of the Great Depression. There was 25% unemployment. And when he'd take over a hotel, it was fairly easy for him to do that with very little money because nobody was going into real estate. And the reason they weren't going into real estate is because the hotels had almost zero occupancy. In, in fact, it's rather like today. I mean, to me today, sounds very much like the D Great Depression where things are just teetering on the edge or going bankrupt. I mean, it's really rough times. So what did father do that enabled him to do something completely contrarian? If everybody else was running away from real estate and he just bulldozed his way into it without a background in hotels, what enabled him not only to make his hotels a success, but have them grow into something international that at the time of his death, there were 400 hotels. And I used to ask him that. You know, as a kid, it was just really, really clear to me that father was a very successful man. I mean, we lived in a huge house with a ballroom. Actually, our summer house had a ballroom. Wow. Uh, I mean, so that's a little clue to a kid that, you know, daddy's doing pretty well. So I'd, I'd ask him over and over again the same question, and I'd get different answers. Uh, but the question was, how did you do it? And let me give you one of his examples. And come back with me to the year 1933, and father has just taken over a hotel. And he told me this is what he did with all his hotels, but I'm going to give an example of one. The day that he'd take possession of a hotel that had been, you know, teetering on the edge of bankruptcy, of the hotel to come into the hotel's ballroom. There might be 400 people, there might be 800 people, and every one of them was just thoroughly demoralized. Father knew this, because this was a time where if you lost your job, getting a new one was just not going to happen. It probably meant breadline for you. So everybody walking into that hotel ballroom was miserable, depressed, afraid. Wow. Father knew that. So there he is standing up in the stage of the ballroom, looking out at his audience of, of scared, demoralized people. And the first words out of his mouth was, were, every one of you keeps your job. And, you know, imagine what that must have meant to them. But then he went on. Not only do you keep your job, but I want you to keep your job because you know your job better than anybody else in the world. 
and I believe in you, and I know that together we're going to make this hotel the most prosperous, the most successful, the most popular, the best served hotel in the whole city. And together, we're going to be an example to the rest of the city of how things can turn around. And I believe in you, and because I do, my job is to give you the resources and the encouragement to show the world just how good you are. Well, imagine yeah. what that must have meant to them. That's, uh, is, go ahead, but that's, go ahead. That, that's the beginning of the story. Yeah. Oh, uh, the next day, remember father was telling me about this. Every time he took over a hotel, the first money he ever spent on the hotel, and if a hotel's been going bankrupt, it's been going to seed, you know, the carpets are stained, the curtains are frayed. The, what father would do, would, uh, he knew he had to spend some money refurbishing the hotel, but the first money in every case went to the places the public would never see. It would be like the employee dining rooms, the employee showers, lockers. Wow. And so I asked him, of course, uh, you know, Daddy, why didn't you spend money where the public would see it so that you'd get your money back? And he told me words that I share with everybody. I mean, I, I want people to know this. The phrase that he answered with was, people have a compulsion to live up to or down to your expectations. So by, by communicating to them how important they were, and you know, yeah. th th that, was, that was one of his ways of creating employee engagement. But even that's not the end of the story. You know, if father was able to build an organization where 20,000 people were working for him, that meant that very few people ever left him. He was famous that if you started working for him, you stayed with him for life. Well. You know, of course, I'm curious about that. So I ask him, you know, when you're standing up in front of your new employees the first time they ever see you, why did you promise them the jobs right off? You know, why didn't you make a contingent in some way, like, uh, you know, do a good job or something? And he said that persuasion comes in three flavors. And two of them are good, sorry, one of them is good, and two of them are rotten. And let's deal with the rotten ones first. He said he could have stood up in front of them and used intimidation. That's flavor number one. He could have stood up in front of them and say, shape up or you're fired. But he said intimidation, it will get you short-term agreement and compliance, but it's done grudgingly, so it's not a good plan. He said plan number two, I could have said, do a great job and there's a raise in it for you do a great job and their bonus is in for you. He said, that flavor is bribery. So we've had intimidation, we've had bribery. He said, what's wrong with bribery is that it's too contractual, it's too transactional. People will work for the bribe, but not for anything bigger. And he wanted something bigger than that, plus bribery, you have to keep upping the ante. So he felt that persuasion in the form of bribery just wasn't a good approach. So, of course, I say, well, what does work? He said, inspiration. He said, inspire, don't require. And he said, a leader's job is to give people a better vision of themselves. And in the case of the people who are working at the hotel, you know, you're not waiting on tables. You're building the most popular inspirational hotel in the city. And you're not just tending bar. You're part of of something much bigger than yourself. You're part of a winning team. So I loved his approach of inspire, don't require. Wow. Um, the, the, I, I'm, I'm worried, Mitzi, that we're going to run out of our 30 minutes because this should be 30 hours. Oh, thank you. Um, but I, I have a couple questions. I, I think I caught you earlier when you said this. There were 400 hotels or hotel chains when your dad started. Uh, when he died, he owned 400 hotels because it was a family-owned business. It was it. It, it was publicly traded, but we we owned I think 36 percent. So, okay. so I was we, just curious uh, when he started, what was his interest in hotels and hospitality, and why did he believe that? Was there anything in his background or his family or his upbringing? None, zero. Wow. In fact, he's he's one of the biggest cases of somebody overcoming deficits and transforming himself because at age 26 he couldn't figure out what he wanted to do in life and that was 
roughly 10 years before he started the hotel company, went to a guidance counselor and he took you know, a whole day of tests. And at the end of it, the guidance counselor told him, Mr. Henderson, you know, you're clearly a very bright person, but your social skills are so terrible. Your ability to relate to people is so abysmal that I recommend for you a career as a scientist in a wow. cubicle where you don't have to interact with anybody. Yeah. Well, I think he took that as a challenge because he began taking psychology courses. He, I know that he read How to Win Friends and Influence People every 10 years. He took that course. He took speaking courses. He'd made friends with psychiatrists and psychologists. He made it an absolute huge effort to learn everything he could about what motivates people and what makes them tick. And it's almost as if his greatest deficit when he worked on it like that became his greatest strength. Because yeah, I think actually... the average person is, isn't going to see through to what he saw through. And he saw through because he had studied it and learned it and it didn't come natural. Wow, yeah, and, and I always say that your greatest strength is your greatest weakness because people are, they, they don't understand what the this other side of them is and you have to surround yourself with people better. And it almost sounds like as he recognized that, he, he realized the more people you can have around that have a different perspective, it was his, it, that was his strength, but he realized, I think you have to put people around you to be successful. And that's what sounds like it led to the three flavors. The inspiration was what he had to transpose on people. Yeah. I mean, again, to, to re-quote him, uh, a leader's job is to give people a better vision of themselves. And people, I think, felt really energized. I mean, I've talked with many of the people who worked with him, and, and, and they loved him, and they wanted to please him. Wow. And so with you growing up, because what, what were the two or three biggest motivational factors he had on you as a child or a teenager? And then I want to talk about how it may have transformed or something different. So growing up, what was that like to have somebody that was driven and motivated, but inspirational? Did, did it lead you down an entrepreneurial path? Did you not like, what, what was that like? It was, it was really interesting because mother, was, you know, this is, we're talking 30s, 40s, 50s, the role, the roles that women played it there. And I didn't have a role model for being entrepreneurial. And mother was, I think she played a huge role in being a hostess for him, but I don't think she had anything to do with running the business. So what inspired me to do it? Gosh, I, I've sometimes wondered if it's even genetic, uh, you know, that if you can, you do. Yeah. And when did you start realizing you had an entrepreneurial spirit and what, what sort of things did you do early on that you were either passionately motivated by or scared but decided you wanted to do anyway? Uh, let's go with scared but wanted to do anyway. Uh, by age 34, I had a really nice degree from Harvard and a master's in public administration and I just hadn't done anything with my life by age 34. Yeah, but, with a degree from Harvard, most people yeah, just... <laughs> I mean, I, I, In comparison, I, I understand. <laughs> well, I wasn't doing anything with my life, but yeah. I had a very, very good friend who was an example of... That absolutely changed my life, but he was an example of... I decided to build my life and being the opposite of his. There was a man, and we're going to call him Peter Smith, although that's not his real okay. name. Uh, Peter Smith had an IQ of more than 200. And to put that in context, Einstein was 180. Yeah. Well, Peter Smith wanted to use these, you know, he felt an obligation. He'd been given this tremendous gift and he wanted to give back to the world kind of in gratitude for what had been given to him. And the way he was going to do it was to write a great book. And the great book, it was called Life, an Owner's Manual. And for decades and decades and decades, he was collecting information from all the wisdom of the world, and he was going to put it all together to write this great book. But at age 68, at age 68, he was diagnosed with terminal heart disease. And that meant that he couldn't write his book, so he was as depressed as a human being could be, partly because he was going to die, but partly because his whole life would be wasted because he had never gotten around to writing the book that he'd been for all his life. Well, something close to a miracle happened. He went to the Pritikin Clinic in Southern California for a month, and 
he was, I mean, it was close to being cured. When he came yeah. back, he'd lost 15 pounds. He had energy. He didn't have crippling heart pain. Uh, you know, he had gotten his life back. He wasn't about to die. And I said, Peter, this is the most wonderful news in the world. Write your book. And he said, yes, I'm just about to. A little more study and I'll be ready. Well, I'm going to guess that you can guess what happened next. He didn't write the book. If you never start, you're never ready. Yeah. Uh, he, he died 20 years later yeah. without having written the book. And as I, you know, I watched this in real time and I decided, you know, I don't have a gift of an IQ of 200, but I ought to be doing more with what I do have. And so I began analyzing what was holding me back and actually what had held him back. And it was the same thing, I think, fear of failure. I was afraid to audition for things. I was afraid to invest in my own. I was afraid of, I was, I was afraid of failure. I was afraid of turndowns. Uh, you know, in a, on a hundred different scores, I was afraid of failure. So I decided if I was going to make anything in my life, that I would redefine failure. For me, from then on, failure would be not trying, not jumping in, giving it my all, and. If I didn't get what I wanted, or if I fell on my face, I'd still call it a badge of honor because I had tried, and along the sure. way, I would have learned things, I would have met people, I would have taken courses, I would have attended conventions. I mean, I would be farther along the road to success just by having tried. And, and so what were some of the first things you tried when you started going through this epiphany of I'm going to try, I want to make a difference, you've got an amazing degree, a family history, you what was the first passion or motivation where you said, okay, this is the direction I want to try and go? Well, the first thing I wanted to do was agriculture. My father died when I was 26 years old. And yeah, nobody expected him to die at age 70. It was you know, a very unexpected event. Yeah. And I think in today, a lot, of, a lot of families would have been or would be more sophisticated about preparing heirs. But you know, we thought he was going to live to 90, his father and you know, others in the family had been long lived. So suddenly here I am with an inheritance. We sold the hotel, by the way, shortly after his death. So here I've got this great big cash inheritance and trust from my mother, my father, and a third that I could just do whatever I wanted with. I was, yeah, I thought have an advisor and put it in the stock market. But it occurred to me it would be much more fulfilling and exciting to invest in agricultural land, in productive agricultural land. Oh, okay. So yeah, here I am over my fear of failure, but part of overcoming fear of failure isn't just jumping in blind. To take four years studying agronomy, agricultural accounting, uh, rural appraisal, just everything that I possibly could to prepare myself for this. And the, after three years, I made it my business to get to know as many farmers in the area, we're talking Northern California, to get to know all the ag extension people, the professors at the college, just everything I possibly could about it. And finally, I invested in agricultural land. And you know, what a leap of faith that is, because I'm a woman. Yeah. I'm actually a Boston hotel area <laughs> debutante. You know, what am I doing? Harvard, uh, Poli yeah. Sci, now yeah, you're a farmer. Am, <laughs> yeah, but what am I doing jumping into, uh, into agriculture uh, with no family background in it whatsoever? The only background I had was the studying that I've been doing for four years. I looked at probably four different, sorry, 40 different farms, and I think I could have written a doctoral thesis in each one of them and I'd be very close to buying something and then I'd find some, some terrible flaw in it and wouldn't buy it. What I finally did buy, I mean, it did very, very well. And I've calculated that the money that was left in trust for me, I've, I've multiplied, it was three equal pots. My pot exceeds the other two pots by 200 times. And so wow. I'm really liking the idea of investing on your own, but only if you're put a lot of effort into researching and knowing what you're doing. Yeah, and so if, if we sort of will start transitioning forward from 
your childhood from that happening unexpectedly with your dad from the, the aspect of saying, this is the direction I want to go. I'm curious, what are the two or three takeaways you had as a child that you think not child up through, you know, your twenties when this happened, what, what are one or two or three things that you learned growing up in that environment that you've been able to apply today as you've moved forward? Well, one is persistence. Father was, oh, he was a big believer in persistence. I, I mentioned earlier that I was forever asking him what made you a success. And one of them is he said that his competitors might get discouraged after trying something 40 times. He was perfectly willing to try a hundred times. And so that's guided me wonderfully. I mean, I can yeah. get down for all sorts of things now. I'm going to keep trying. So I'm a huge believer in persistence. The other thing that father was, I made up a word. I mean, maybe somebody else uses it, but you know how they're carnivores and herbivores? Sure. I call him an informivore, information okay. with power. Uh, he, was, he was a huge believer that one good idea can change your life. And so he used to put himself in the way of good ideas. He would, he would I mean, he was, he was a famous businessman, but he'd still take courses, he'd still attend lectures, he'd you know, read books right and left. He, was, he had a library, and as you know, my childhood memories of him were forever that, you know, just reading and studying. Yeah. So uh, I, I love his idea of one good idea can change your life, and therefore put yourself in the way of as many good ideas as you can. Wow. And so I want to kind of, I, I want to gently transition into some of the stuff you're going now, but there's a history as well with the Purdue and the food side. Is there anything in there that you want to talk about in terms of that other aspect and that side of your life and things you might've learned? Oh, I'd adore to, because Frank was my hero from beginning to end. Uh, I, I thought he was just a fabulous genius, but he had the same attitude that my father did that it's the people at every level that make you a success. And I'm going to give a quote that, that applied to Frank. And it's well, a, I apologize, Mitzi. Just for context, I, don't forget that quote. Tell us who Frank is and how you met him. And that way, when we get to the quote, it'll add a little more weight, please. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Frank Perdue was in the chicken industry. And he started with a father and son operation, him and his father. And by the time of his death, he employed 20,000 people. And just like, uh, just as with my father, he realized that the key to success was to be working with good people who, who were engaged. And as far as I can tell, every interaction that he had with the employees or with the people who, even whether they were buyers or sellers or people who worked with him, he put huge effort into human relations. And the, the quote that I was gonna share, it comes from William James 100 years ago. But it, here's the quote that I think guided Frank. The deepest principle of human nature is the craving for appreciation. Yeah, recognition. And, and, yeah, and, and Frank was really big on like learning people's names. I bet he knew thousands of names. and. Uh, if he was talking with you, you felt that you were the center of his universe and you were at that time. I mean, he just, the rest of the world didn't exist. Whoever you were, whether you were somebody working on the line or president of the United States, he, he was really good at listening. And something that I noticed about him, I mean, I hope I noticed a lot of things, but one that stands out is that in almost any situation I'd ever see him in, he would talk 10% of the time and listen 90% of the time. And there's so much value to that because yeah. first of all, the person feels important if you're really listening to them. Uh, and second, you're probably gonna learn some good stuff. So let's just briefly, how did you meet? And then what, what kind of influence did that side of your life have? And then I, I really wanna spend time on what you're doing now with the book and the, and the, the nonprofit and that kind of stuff. So, How'd you meet? And then what was that influence over, over the time there? All right, we met in 1988. And I was living in California growing rice, happily growing rice. Uh, but at that time, I was president of the oldest and largest farm women's organization, American Agri-Women. And Which you are still, correct? 
Uh, no, the past president. I'm very, I'm very involved with it. Got I mean, it. Okay. I don't think a week goes by without communicating with people in agriculture. But at that time, I was president. And uh, American Agriwomen is a little bit about lobbying and, and telling agriculture's side of, of issues in Washington. So I was in Washington at a party given by Senator Bob Dole, who was also a presidential candidate at the time. Mm -hmm. I got invited to a party. Frank Purdue was at the party. <laughs> and we, unfortunately, I had to leave early and he arrived late and we only overlapped by 10 minutes. Uh, but in that time, we decided that chicken and rice go well together. Nice, <laughs> very cool. And, and so from that time with that, you know, marriage and food and all of that, what, what aspects did you learn from the history around Frank that you've applied to what you're doing now? And then let's really catch up to, to present time. Okay, Frank, like my father, was really good on long shots. I mean, I remember early on in our marriage, just being astonished because he, he talked with me about things. My mind would think that can't work. It doesn't have a chance. But he would plunge through and make things happen that you'd think couldn't happen. So it made me a big believer in long shots. Wow. Okay. And, and, and being very, very persistent. It's funny how much his success and how much father's success in a way marched in tandem. It was yeah. it was amazing to me that the ingredients of my father's success, I watched my late husband carry them out also. Wow, fascinating. So where are you on now? Obviously, you and I met through Mark Victor Hansen, a good friend of mine and yours, Chicken Soup for the Soul. And you have a, a book out and some other projects. So let's let's fast forward to Mitzi Purdue today. What, right. what are you doing? What are you passionate about? What, what do you see going forward? All right. I'm a little bit pessimistic about what's going on in the economy. And it's not because of depression, although, good Lord, that's that's a concern. Yeah. My biggest concern at the moment is food supply or food security, because as past president of American Agriwomen, I get to talk with, with women from all over the country. And I learn stories that um, I think people aren't taking enough into account. When you, you mentioned kindly that I, or maybe I said it, that I have a master's in public administration. Mm -hmm. What you learn in public administration almost day one is that any policy decision is a trade-off. You know, there, there's rarely something that's perfect. There's, there's a cost to everything you do, and you have to weigh what's important, and, and well, you just have to weigh the alternatives. Sure. And my current concern is that the people who are deciding about how much, how much you uh, weigh the deaths that are clear and visible from COVID-19, how much you weigh against those which are clear and visible and their names attached to them and their numbers and everybody can talk about them, how much you weigh that against something else? And that is that the longer the country, the longer our supply chain is disrupted, I think the more likely there is that there will be a food deficit, hunger. I mean, bef before the pandemic struck, there were a lot of people who were food insecure. I've read that it's that a recent survey, recent, um, well, late winter of 2020, okay. that, that that survey said that 38% of Americans feel food insecure right now. And I think that probably comes from looking at empty shelves. But what happens when something else that we know is going on? We know that, that all sorts of, say, hub farmers, they know that every hog they grow, they're going to lose $36 because it takes a lot to feed them and you know, other costs, vet costs, and so on. So they're going to cut way back on their, on their hogs. Yeah. I've, I've read that in the industry I'm associated with, and I'm not referring to my family's company, I'm referring to the whole industry, that in many cases, they're, they're breaking 10% of the eggs that would normally grow up to be chickens that we would eat. I've talked with farmers, with dairy farmers, who say 20% of their milk, as long as the supply chain is broken, uh, is going down the drain. And by the way, every problem that, that exists in agriculture right now, I think could be cured if, if we had like a year or two to put it back together again. 
But the, the pandemics hit so suddenly that it takes time to rearrange supply chains. And I'm just worried that the longer, the longer people aren't going to work, the more disruption in the supply chain and the more farmers, you know, that you don't want to plant a crop that you can't get paid for, that you can't, you know, that you're going to go broke selling it. So the economic signals in person after person that I've talked with, they aren't planting there. I'm thinking of onions, potatoes, sweet corn. And it's not that nobody's planting them, but I guarantee you that there's a very big cutback. Yeah, and you and I talked about that. And, and I think what'll be fascinating because as I said, when we started that 30 minutes isn't gonna be long enough, it should be 30 hours. Oh, I love that, thank you. Um, what, what I think I'd like to do, Mitzi, is, I there's still so much that I want to talk about with you. So maybe we'll do this in two parts and have you back because this was a lot of entrepreneurial historical perspective. I still think there's a lot about food security, what's going on with the FDA and the other Sunny Purdue, not, not, not any correlation. Um, but then also just real quick, you still have your nonprofit and charity around human trafficking. There's so much about you that I think we'd love to learn about. And, and so we may just have to circle back and do this again, if that's okay. Nothing would give me more joy. However, out of loyalty to Mark Victor Hansen, can we mention the book that, that he and I have just written? Well, please. So th this is what I, I want. We just have a little bit of time left. Let's talk briefly, if you would, about the book and mention that and what the, the title is and how to find it. And also, if you're comfortable, your organization, I'd still like you to talk a little bit about that. and then. We'll come back with a whole full-blown interview just on Mitzi Purdue. How about that? I'd be so honored. I wouldn't Perfect. know what to do with myself. Perfect. So let's do the book and your, your nonprofit. Okay, the book. Yes. How to be up in when times are down. What a great and, title, too. Uh, that's that's Mark's. Yay, yeah. Mark. And it's 40 tips. And I think people, will, you know, the people I've shown it to have said that it's just remarkable. This is information you're not going to get elsewhere. And it's profoundly useful. In yeah, fact, and, you, and you with your website that we'll promote, you do a lot of public speaking, you've got other books. That's why I said there's a whole Mitzi side that we have to talk about. Um, the, the nonprofit as well, I know you're passionate on the, the trafficking side. I think human trafficking is the worst evil in the world. I, and so I, I've decided, I'm, I'm 79 years old and really proud of it. I intend to devote the years that remain to me to doing whatever I can to help prevent human trafficking. And the premise for how I think I can help is, I've had a lot of experience over my life in fundraising and also in publicity. So I have ways of fundraising, namely, it's, it's not applicable while, while the times are as hard as they are right now. But in the future and in the past, people have items that, you know, high, highly valuable items that maybe they're tired of. Maybe the new wife doesn't like the old wife's jewelry or something. Uh, I'm planning, or Sotheby's has agreed to an auction at some point, but we don't have a date because you know, we don't know what the economy is going to look yeah. like, where people will auction items and then give it to the anti-trafficking organization of their choice. I'm just a pass-through. I, I help arrange things, but... Uh, and I help them get high prices for them. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's why I said, I, I want to really devote another session with you to talk about you and your book and that organization, because I think there's so many ways I, I could help as well. So oh, wow. yeah, I, I appreciate your time. I know you're super busy on the, the East Coast out there. We'll put up all your information and how to get in touch with you. And I promise we'll circle back. So um, I would adore it. And I'd, I'd adore to... Uh, to hear from any of your audience because I, I love interacting with people. Well, we have some, I have a few people that I, I, I'm already as I'm, anybody that sees me looking off to the right, it's because I'm writing and taking notes on flavors and people and all sorts of things. So uh, again, Steve and me, the Bullseye Guy podcast. Thanks for everybody tuning in. We aren't quite back in the Groove Radio studios in downtown LA yet with, with Eagle. We're all remote, but I feel that's changing. I know we're going to be a part of it and, and I have a feeling Mitzi will as well. So. Thank you again, Mitzi. Thanks so much.